For 96 years, the Ford Hall Forum has been engaging people in discussions and debates about issues that are in the news and on our minds. And tonight, we continue that tradition as we are privileged to present Jin Nguyen, Nam Pham, and Hip Chu. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, 30 years ago, following the Vietnam War, the first waves of, wave of Vietnamese immigration to Boston and other cities began. 130,000 Vietnamese fled Vietnam in 1975. The exodus continued, and as of the 2000 census, there were well over 1 million Vietnamese Americans living in the United States, the fifth largest Asian immigrant group, group in the country. Tonight, you will hear more about generational issues, cultural barriers and challenges, and the contributions Vietnamese Americans have made to the city of Boston. This fall, the Ford Hall Forum has hosted a great roster of speakers and explored a broad range of issues, so please make sure you're on our mailing list so we can let you know dates, times, and topics. Uh, tonight actually marks the end of our fall series, but we're putting together a very interesting and dynamic spring series, which I think you'll enjoy, so please give us a wave for us to let you know about it. And when you walked in, you were probably given this yellow survey form. If you have completed it, thank you. If you have not, we would really appreciate your helping us out. The Fort Hall Forum is in the process of beginning a strategic planning process, and the information that you can give us on this survey will be very helpful to us. And if there are programs, topics, speakers you would be interested in our presenting, Please let us know about that as well. Some of the most um, exciting and um, dynamic programs the Ford Hall Forum has presented have come from suggestions from our audience, so please don't hesitate to do that. And there's one more thing you can do. Um, the Ford Hall Forum's programs are always free and open to the public, but they do cost us money to present. Uh, we depend on your support so we can continue to follow and sponsor events of the day and, and, and present programs like this. Our annual memberships are only $35, which has to be the best deal in town. So please become a supporter. We'd appreciate it. And very quickly, I'd like to list um, or acknowledge our generous corporate and foundation support that includes the Lowell Institute, the Lincoln and Therese Filene Foundation, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and Northeastern University, which serves as our home base. Tonight, tonight's program is being recorded. If you are sharing a comment or a question at the end of the program, or rather the second half of the program, I urge you to use the microphone that is in front here, and please, Understand that by speaking, you are giving us permission to record you. And one last uh, request is when you come to the microphone, if you would speak uh, slowly and clearly, it would be helpful in this space. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Kiang, tonight's moderator. Peter is Professor of Education and Director of Asian American Studies Program at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, where he has taught since 1987. His research, teaching, and advocacy both in high school and college with Asian American immigrant and or refugee students is well known and well respected. He is currently co-president of the Chinese Historical Society of New England and chair of the Massachusetts Advisory Committee for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He earned undergraduate and graduate degrees from Harvard and has been a community fellow at MIT. Please help me welcome Peter, who is here. Thank you, Anne, and thank you for coming to tonight's uh, program. It's happening in this historic location, not only the site of famous speeches over the years, but also for, as many of you know, the site of citizenship oaths for many immigrants and refugees. So it's a very 
special place. The claiming of citizenship is one of the most powerful moments uh, for immigrant and refugee uh, community members uh, in Massachusetts. And uh, tonight we'll hear a little bit of, of those stories. Um, if you'll bear with me, before introducing our panel who's going to share their perspectives about the Vietnamese community in Boston and uh, connections locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, I'm going to open with some images that will take you into um, a little bit of the history and, and the life of the Vietnamese community in Boston and just get us started. So bear with me for a minute. I'm going to go down to the computer and we'll get started with some images. Then we'll open um, with uh, each of the panelists um, sharing some background information and perspectives um, from their particular um, stance as uh, refugees, immigrants, all of them born in Vietnam, uh, all of them major leaders in the Vietnamese community uh, over, during the past 10 to 20 years. Um, and um, then we'll have a lot of chance for discussion and questions um, with you. So just give me a second. I'll be right So most of you know in Fields Corner, there is the fifth largest Vietnamese community in the United States, uh, an amazing, uh, vibrant, uh, vital uh, part of city and community life in, in Boston. Um, and probably you will remember in 1992 this famous uh, moment in Boston politics when City Councilor Dapper O'Neill, the late Dapper O'Neill, um, commented at the Dorchester Day Parade, I thought I was in Saigon, for Christ's sakes. It makes you sick, for Christ's sakes. Needless to say, that comment by uh, one of Boston's elected officials led to uh, ethnic protest at City Hall. Uh, the very first rally of Vietnamese Americans uh, for racial justice, I think, in the United States. It happened here in Boston, uh, that same um, June 1992. Councillor O'Neill was given a chance to apologize to the Vietnamese community at that rally. He chose not to. And that was, a, uh, I think, a critical moment in the awakening of uh, consciousness about getting involved with local electoral politics and the fact that at that time, Vietnamese Americans really did not have much of a voice in the city of Boston. That led, of course, to many, many meetings uh, and uh, the de development of community organizations, some of which were already active, some of which were um, newly emerging. And the presence of Vietnamese in Boston uh, began really taking shape, taking form. Um, many activities, cultural, historical, political, social, economic, um, Another very important moment, um, the groundbreaking for the Vietnamese Community Center um, on Charles Street in Dorchester. Um, in this picture, you'll see uh, uh, one of the panelists, Hip Chu, and also Mary Chung, who, whose idea uh, tonight's forum, uh, which, um, that came from Mary, working with Anne. So thank you to Mary for making tonight possible. The groundbreaking then led to um, the actual construction and opening of the community center. All three of the panelists tonight um, played major roles in the leadership effort to make this center happen. There's nothing like it in the United States. And leaders in Vietnamese communities across the country have come to take a look at it and learn uh, from how did they do it here in Boston. Uh, elsewhere in Fields Corner, you also see these um, images and um, markers of Vietnamese community life. And not only within the Vietnamese community, but in um, more public events such as Memorial Day uh, in Dorchester at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, uh, you certainly see an active presence of um, the Vietnamese community. Uh, of course, there are Vietnamese veterans as well as U.S. veterans who served in the Vietnam War and uh, the legacy of the war, particularly as we are again at war today, um, has you know, powerful connections. There are temples um, 
including one in Fields Corner, um, as well as in Roslindale and East Boston and in other sites across the, the state. And so Vietnamese community life is certainly, um, you see the impact of it spiritually. Economically as well, besides the cluster of Vietnamese businesses right in the Fields Corner area and um, aspects of Chinatown as well, even in Copley Place, you are beginning to see that um, presence and that representation of Vietnamese Americans. Probably no uh, image more uh, graphically connects the past with uh, the politics of of Vietnamese in Boston today. Um, the yellow flag with three red stripes representing the flag of the Republic of Vietnam, the South Vietnamese flag um, before 1975. You see that um, at events um, continuously uh, in the community. And sure enough, in contrast to Dapper O'Neill's proclamation in 1992, a little more than a decade later, the entire Boston City Council voted um, taking into account there's a major Vietnamese constituency to be aware of. And so this resolution was passed by the city council in 2003, recognizing that flag um, of the uh, South uh, Vietnamese government. With all of this um, growth and, and contribution and impact on the city, it's not uh, simply a success story, though. There's still uh, injustice, discrimination, and racist violence. Um, this is the altar of, uh, in the home of Bang Mai, who, a 16-year-old who was uh, beaten to death on a basketball court in South Boston two summers ago. Uh, the um, white youth who killed him um, pleaded guilty in that case, and sentencing is supposed to um, t take place this month in, uh, in court in Boston. So how do we learn about these stories, these images? How do we take it seriously? These are some of my own students from UMass Boston um, who are part of this process of learning to understand the importance of the Vietnamese community's history and to take part in documenting its successes as well as its struggles. Um, and if you'll just uh, kind of go with me for another couple of minutes, I'm gonna take you into this, um, this short story uh, with this title, I'm not Chinese, I'm Vietnamese. In fact, I'm actually not Vietnamese, I'm Chinese, but that is another story. How do we recognize um, the Vietnamese American stories uh, in Boston? So this was one way of getting into that. This was created by two of my students. There was a girl named V. She was born in America, but her family was from Vietnam. V's parents gave her the name V to remind her that Vietnam is her homeland and she should be proud of her heritage. One day, several incidents happened to V that made her think about her Vietnamese identity. It was a field trip day in her school. V got on the bus and sat next to Tom. Tom likes kung fu movies and video games. He turned to V and asked, Hey V, is your dad a kung fu master? No, my dad's a lawyer. Why did you ask that? Well, Tom said, I thought that Chinese people know a lot about Kung Fu, but I guess that's not true in your family. And if you could say this aloud together, that would be a really good thing to do. Okay. The bus arrived at a park. Everyone got off the bus and followed Mrs. Rose. V was busy chasing the butterflies and did not pay attention. When she looked up, all her classmates and Mrs. Rose were gone. V hurried up to catch up with everyone. A man with a dog was walking by. He smiled at V and said, Ni hao. V smiled at him too and asked, What does ni hao mean? The man said, Oh, did I say it wrong? It means hello in Chinese. V kept walking faster to catch up to her classmates. An old woman walked by and asked, Are you lost, my dear? Yes, ma'am. I'm trying to find my classmates and Mrs. Rose. Have you seen them? Oh, yes, they went this way, the old woman pointed. Thank you. You're welcome, dear, the old woman said. And you speak awful good English for a Chinese girl like you. But I'm not Chinese. I'm Vietnamese. V kept walking faster to catch up to her classmates and Mrs. Rose. 
A college girl on rollerblades was passing by. She came to V and introduced herself. Hi, my name is Michelle. What's your name? My name is V, and I'm looking for my classmates and Mrs. Rose. Have you seen them? Yeah, I saw them sitting on the benches having lunch. Just walk straight ahead. You're not far from them. Thank you. No problem, but before you go, could you help me with something here? Michelle asked. Sure, V nodded her head. I just bought this T-shirt I'm wearing, and it has some Chinese characters on it. Could you tell me what they mean? Finally, V found her classmates and Mrs. Rose. They were all sitting on benches having lunch. Mrs. Rose made V sit on the bench close to her. This way, she could make sure that V would not get lost again. Sitting on the bench next to V was Amy. Amy was having a ham and cheese sandwich. V was having rice and marinated beef with vegetables. Amy looked at V's lunch curiously and asked, "V, can I try some of your lunch? You can have some of mine." V looked at Amy's sandwich and said, "Okay, let's switch." After they finished each other's meal, Amy rubbed her stomach and said, "Whoa, that was the best Chinese food I've ever had. I wish I could live in your house so I can eat Chinese food every day." Why do people think I'm Chinese? I don't understand. V was very confused. She went to Mrs. Rose's bench and told her what had happened. Mrs. Rose paused for a moment after V finished talking. She put down her coffee cup and said, "V, I think I know something we can do." There's a lot of ways the story could end, and here's one way. Tonight, I'll take you to the Ford Hall Forum at Faneuil Hall. Some important Vietnamese American community leaders will be speaking. I'm sure they can help us figure this out. So it's my honor to present to you three of the major leaders of Boston's Vietnamese community.、Um, we talked about how we wanted to have the order, and so we're going to go a little bit by tradition and a little bit by、uh, what makes sense chronologically. So we'll begin、um, with respecting our elders. Uh, this is Mr. Nam Pham. Nam is also, of the three panelists, the person that came to Massachusetts and Boston first. He came in the first wave of refugee resettlement in 1975. He'll be followed by Mr. Hip Chu, who came in 1980,、um, and then、um, uh, third will be Ms. Trin Nguyen, who came in 1984-85.、Um, they've each. Played connected roles in some of the community organizations, and they've also had very distinct,、um, both career paths and leadership paths in the community.、Uh, Nam is very well known for his work in the、uh, commercial sector, in in the Asian American Bank, and Citizens Bank, and and Fleet Bank,、um, as well as his、uh, leadership statewide as former commissioner of、uh, the Massachusetts Office for Refugees and Immigrants,、um, and many many other roles that he's played.、Um, A couple of my students in the audience also said, "Hey, isn't that the guy who's on、um, Viet TV?" And sure enough,、uh, he is, and so he's here with us.、Um, Hip Chu, going second,、uh, is the newly selected、uh, executive director of Viet Aid, one of the co-sponsoring organizations of tonight's forum. Hip has a, a long history with Viet Aid, and、uh, prior to that, played an early leadership role in the Vietnamese American Civic Association.、Um, And uh, many other uh, organizations in the nonprofit sector、uh, in Massachusetts, and Trin Nguyen, who is the、uh, director of development for the Boston Women's Fund,、uh, plays a major role in、uh, the philanthropic sector in Massachusetts,、uh, supporting social justice projects,、uh, not only for Vietnamese Americans or Asian Americans,、uh, but for、um, many projects that have local as well as global connections. Uh, Trin also has played leadership roles in many other organizations. She's a board member of the Chahara Foundation and Associated Grant Makers of Massachusetts.、Um, we're really honored that all three of them are here with us, and we're going to begin with Nam,、uh, who's going to、um, go through a little bit of his own background and sharing some ideas about、um, the contributions and struggles of the Vietnamese community in Boston. So please welcome Nam Pham. Uh, good evening, and、uh, thank you so much,、uh, Peter, and thank you, Anne,、uh, for a former、uh, refugee like me who came to America with、uh, very little English and、uh, basically with a shirt on my back. It's really a real honor 
to be a part uh, of this uh, prestigious forum, especially sitting in this building, which we all know is the, uh, the uh, cradle of liberty. And uh, with that, I am very grateful for this uh, opportunity. Uh, if you are uh, old enough uh, to remember what happened in 1975, or if uh, you learned uh, enough uh, U.S. and Vietnamese history, uh, you would know that uh, Vietnamese uh, came to America uh, as refugees. And we came in, to, it's not under uh, our best circumstances. Uh, we came here as refugees, and by definition, uh, refugees uh, are someone who are fleeing uh, persecution. Uh, we were fleeing uh, communism. Uh, we were uh, running for our life. And, but uh, worse than that, uh, for Vietnamese refugees, uh, we also came to America with, especially for people who came here in 1975, we came here as losers. Uh, we came here because we had lost the war. We lost our home. Uh, we lost our family. We lost our future. And also, under uh, the perspective of uh, the media, uh, South Vietnamese had always been losers. Uh, during the war, after the war, we often were portrayed uh, in the mainstream media as cowards. We did not fight for our freedom. We did not fight for our country. Uh, our leaders uh, were corrupted. Uh, as a matter of fact, I recall that uh, in 1975, right after the war, uh, many uh, U.S. Uh, political leaders, including our Massachusetts leaders, uh, openly said that the U.S. should not accept any South Vietnamese because we were basically, basically losers. Uh, so to, uh, with that background, uh, it, it was quite difficult for us to, uh, to adjust into a totally new environment uh, in our mindset and also in the uh, reception to, uh, of, uh, uh, of others. Uh, we also came here in different ways, like uh, Peter mentioned earlier, uh, and we also came in with different uh, circumstances. Uh, some come in as little kids, uh, just jump on an airplane, and the next day he or she would be in America safe, very safely. Uh, some have uh, survived uh, years of uh, tortures in uh, communist uh, concentration camps. Uh, some come as orphans uh, because of uh, the humanitarian uh, elif of American people, and uh, some have come a survivor of uh, rapes, of uh, savage uh, robberies on the coast of Thailand, in different years. Uh, so with that background, we always try to find a voice uh, for our community. And by our community, uh, I personally feel that we needed to have voices for two different communities. One is for the Vietnamese American community here, and one is also for the Vietnamese people in Vietnam who under the new regime uh, will no longer be allowed to speak freely. Uh, and also, uh, we wanted to have a voice uh, to help uh, those Vietnamese over there, and sorry to help Vietnamese over here. You know, with a lot of things going on in America, especially with uh, the Iraqi, the war in Iraq, whenever someone says, no more Vietnam, I mean, it hurt me personally very deeply. Because the statement of no more Vietnam also, for me, uh, reflects a very misunderstanding of what happened in Vietnam uh, during the war and what happened to Vietnam after the war. Uh, therefore, there is a more urgent need for us to find a voice to validate our existence in America. 
to validate our cause in when we were fighting the communists during the war. I mean, we fought the communists not because the Americans told us to do so, not because we were just uh, a proxy soldier for the American, but we fought the war because we were fighting for our own freedom. Uh, therefore, I personally uh, feel very proud uh, over the past many years uh, that uh, our community, our, the existence of the Vietnamese American in America helped to make the experience of being a Vietnam vet was a good experience. If you recall, many uh, U.S. soldiers, when they returned from Vietnam, they were not treated very kindly by the media, by the many Americans. They were looked at as baby killers or the people who burned the villages. But in the mid-'80s, that's when the community of Vietnamese Americans became significant. It was hip to be a Vietnam vet. So I personally felt that we help contribute into helping America realize the sacrifice of American service men and women in Vietnam. And, and I think we make America stronger also uh, with that uh, discovery of uh, you were fighting for something worthwhile. And of course, uh, like uh, many other previous uh, immigrant, uh, immigrant groups coming to America, uh, Vietnamese community uh, also have contributed economically to our new home. Uh, Massachusetts, America have been very good to us. I'm sure that uh, our, uh, my friends here will share with you more about our contribution uh, to Dorchester, to Boston. I mean, we, uh, we all of us here uh, involved with VietAid, and we are very proud of our little uh, contribution into revitalizing a uh, few corners area, Chinatown, and other part of Boston. And I will stop here, and I will share with you my, more of my thoughts later. Hello, and uh, my name is uh, Hip Chu. Uh, let me go back to 1979. When I first reported to uh, registered to serve to, you know, basically serve um, for the military when I was 17, because basically that was uh, f four years after 1975. Every um, man, when you get 17, you have to register to serve, you know, for the military, and then when you get to 18, you have to serve for two years. Um, at that time, I basically did my registration, and my parents say that, you know, basically you have to, to go. Uh, it, at the time that the Vietnam invaded, or was in, I'm not sure whether that's exactly the term from their perspective, that we had, uh, that Vietnam, Vietnamese uh, government then have 250,000 soldiers stationed in Cambodia, um, there, and um, the chance that I would uh, serve, you know, the militaries fighting the war that my parents clearly did not support. Uh, the, a few months later, I basically, you know, got on the boat. Um, my parents' arrangement, which I was 17, and I probably didn't know too much where I'm going to to go to or end up to. Basically, it's it's basically is is. Um, quite a lifetime experience that, that you have no idea where you're going to end up with. And then, you know, after seven days, uh, you end up to uh, a refugee camp in uh, Malaysia, which that totally, you don't even know, like, I didn't even know, like, where Malaysia is uh, at that time. And uh, six months later, you know, after all the... Uh, Paperwork. I arrived to the United States after my great grand uncle uh, sponsor, and clearly I was totally 
overwhelmed with uh, the whole experience from the time that you got on the boat and end up, you know, six months later to the United States. Uh, I, I first came to Amherst, Massachusetts, which is a western, uh, in the western part of the state. And uh, I was there for um, four years, uh, you know, attending high school, and then I really think that, you know, Amherst is not my, my town. I want to see more Vietnamese. At that time, uh, Amherst, I basically, I mean, I can count the number of families, about four families total in the whole town. And um, after high school, I basically uh, came to Boston to go to college. That's where I really like to see more Vietnamese and end up, you know, knowing though just a few corner then. Um, and that's when I really, you know, somehow you, you really feel like home uh, by seeing, you know, other Vietnamese and uh, knowing them, seeing them, somehow just talk, speaking in Vietnamese, it make you feel more comfortable. And um, I... Um, Slowly from there, uh, become a community activist by default. Uh, my undergrad was a civil engineer. I like to build things. Uh, when you um, first understand about different things, and then you end up, you know, working with community groups and social services, human services. And then one thing that I really learned, uh, really uh, interesting, that I did not know the term undercommonly minor with the whole you know process of refugees resettlement that was in late 1980s when i first worked for vietnamese american civic association and and later i realized i was one of them uh, because i i got out of vietnam without my parents without any adult uh older than 18 and and i was basically uh was one of the undercommonly minor uh, end up, you know, in the United States. And, um, and from there, you just, like, move on and college and work in, with the communities and just move on and on. And, you know, you have uh, family and kids. And, and right now I have two kids. Uh, one is 14 and one is 10. Obviously, uh, I, I do see a couple of major issues is, uh, and uh, challenges for the Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese American communities. I think that absolutely now is right. Uh, we will constantly look for our voices, uh, and I'm not sure whether there is one voice. Um, clearly, People use the term that Vietnamese, a lot of us, even though we live in the United States, but our mind and heart are not physically here. Clearly describe people like myself. Uh, my parents are not here. My parents are in Vietnam. And after three attempts sponsor them to bring them to the United States, they refuse to come because they still have the other five kids, and four of us here, which my siblings are a total of nine brothers and sisters. I mean, four of us here, and uh, five of us there, and my parents in the early 80s. It clearly, not just the Vietnamese American community here in the, in the United States, or in Boston, or in Fields Corner, we also have to talk about there is a Vietnamese community, you know, 21,000 miles away. And that also reflected that to build a community or to find a voice of the community, I'm not sure whether we can do that overnight or the last 30 years because of people like myself. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that probably 90% of Vietnamese or Vietnamese American or Vietnamese who live in the United States or in Boston have very similar situation like myself. Either, you know, their parents, brothers and sisters, and, um, you know, all their relatives have direct connections with Vietnam. Therefore, it's so, would be difficult or it's probably impossible to say that, you know, what's the voice of Vietnamese American communities here? Or what's the voice of, uh, you know, Vietnamese uh, community? 
And it is a struggle for me as well. You know, obviously, we cannot answer that overnight. But the longer we go, we find maybe better paths to um, identify ourselves and uh, to um, to more define exactly uh, what's our relationship between Vietnamese uh, Vietnamese American and Vietnam's over there. It clearly those are the questions. I mean, politically, within the Vietnamese community here, uh, we we made a difference. Uh, but we still have a long way to go because talking about resources within the community, there's no focus on one way or the other. In that way, the, the expertise, the, the human resource, is all dispersed into so many different ways and directions. Therefore, if we have to focus on like one item, one issues within the community, probably we would able to achieve that overnight. But clearly, building a community, we have many issues uh, confront us. I mean, whether we disagree or, or agree to which way, you know, do we go. But those are the issues um, that we have to confront ourselves with. And let me stop here, and then we'll come back with later. Um, I'm going to take a little more time just because I'm the only female in here <laughs> on the panel. Um, uh, actually, first I wanted to uh, thank Anne and uh, Jing Up um, for um, allowing us to speak and then also to doing this forum because I think it's really important. Um, and uh, secondly, I think there are other uh, students out there, young people out there who are more experts than me who can speak uh, to a lot of these issues. Um, so I may not be the best person. Um, and third, I want to say that HIP and ANAM um, really helped shape the leadership of my work here in Boston. And without their work, uh, their support, um, that I wouldn't be sitting here or accomplishing what I have done. So. Um, they're, they're, they paved the path um, for us and for some of our young people. Um, last, Peter, I'm not Chinese, I'm Vietnamese. <laughs> um, so speaking, just a humor thing for the presentation, but I guess people are not laughing, so I'm not funny. Um, no idea. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that a lot of people come and ask me, um, Trin, what is it that you uh, remember about the refugee experience and what was it like? Um, it must have been hard. And I said, well, actually, no. Um, and then they asked me, what did you remember? And I said, I remember a candlelight. And they kept asking me, huh? Uh, and I said, a candlelight. And they didn't know what it was. And I said, the candlelight is reflected upon a dark, wet wood. And that's all I remember of the refugee experience. And uh, a lot of people didn't understand what that was. And it was the candlelight was reflected on, a, on the wet wood in the refugee boat that I came. And me remembering that candlelight was the only way to survive and hope that um, my family can come here in hopes of a better life. And so that is all I remember of the candlelight. Um, but I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about my background because I'm a bit of an oddball. Um, I actually, uh, I, I lived in Chicago, uh, New Orleans, uh, grew up in New Orleans, so I'm a Southern girl, and um, I lived in Worcester, and then uh, went, to, went to school in uh, Ohio, and then I came back to Boston to live. I've been here for about eight years. My background is uh, I got a BA in philosophy and an MA in Ohio State in international development and Southeast Asian area studies. Um, and another MA here in human services. And I'm not telling you my educational background to brag, but to tell you that all of that doesn't mean anything because what makes me a community, um, a, a person that I am is the community background that I have, which is um, the activism that I had uh, when I was 14. Um, do you all remember your high school uh, textbooks in the public schools in the back, there's like this pad that says, um, you, they, they stamp a date on it that says, um, this is the date that you borrow, this is the year that you use the textbook. 
um, and then after a while you can't use that textbook because it's outdated. In the back of the book they have that stamp. So every every year when when a young person uh, is assigned to that class, you get that stamp. And what happened was that um, we got these textbooks and they were stamped and they were um, past five years old, meaning you cannot use it. The public schools were not allowed to use those books. And I said, well, I brought it to the teachers and I said, well, this, uh, these are old and outdated. Uh, we need really quality curriculums and books for for all the, the young kids here. And um, that's when the activism started. Um, so my background is working in the community and in Boston, but I have experience working in Northern Ireland as well, working in the um, North and South uh, peace conflict. And also uh, recently in the last two years in Cuba, where we um, uh, learned about the healthcare system in Cuba, um, and also the way that uh, others uh, use the government resources and also uh, community resources uh, for its its young people and and, um, and its families. Um, my background is in resource development. What that means is that I am a resource provider for social change grassroots groups who need um, financial resources. Um, to sustain their work. So what I do is I fundraise um, and I shift the money over to um, smaller grassroots groups. Um, my interest in the last couple of years um, uh, now uh, particularly has been in diaspora philanthropy, uh, looking at why so many Vietnamese communities have made uh, millions of dollars to uh, Vietnam and as uh, philanthropists and we don't often see ourselves as uh, the givers um, and so one of my uh, special interests is really changing the face of philanthropy to look at non-traditional folks as philanthropists as well. Um, some of the things that I think the Vietnamese community has um, uh, made a huge impact, uh, uh, especially in Boston, is that I don't, you probably all read this in the papers, is that um, the Vietnamese community, uh, some of the residents and the organizers in the Vietnamese community has built alliances with the, uh, with the Chinese community and other Spanish-speaking Spanish groups to work with the Department of Justice to um, sue the city for voting irregularities and racial discrimination. Um, and that was an effort of building alliances with other groups. And the, the, the suit settled about um, four, no, two months ago, right before the election. And now it's mandated that this city has to translate all its ballots into Vietnamese, uh, including all the provisional ones. Into, um, into the language that reflects the constituents that um, is heavily concentrated in that precinct or its ward. They also have to um, hire poll workers that also speak the same language. Um, and so that's one of the huge contributions. And that wasn't just um, two years of overnight effort. It was a huge um, over eight years or 10 years or 15 years over time fighting for the rights of uh, Vietnamese and other um, immigrants uh, uh, electoral rights um, as well. And um, a few, uh, another, um, the other uh, great uh, things that have happened in the Vietnamese community is that, um, and I'm just saying, I'm just giving some success stories from three people who should be here but are not here. Um, and it's probably I, more than three people, but um, some of the most amazing leaders come from our young people. Um, for example, Pauline Nguyen, um, who was a resident at Fields Corner, uh, went away to school, uh, was part of the Coalition for Asian Pacific American Youth that I was working with eight years ago, um, graduated from school, came back to Fields Corner, created a uh, Vietnamese girls empowerment program that addresses the gender-specific needs of Vietnamese girls in Boston. Um, a youth survey um, that was released in 2002 from the mayor's office of youth services reported that Vietnamese girls were the high, had the highest rate of teenage pregnancy amongst all ethnic groups, including white. 
And so we knew that that was a problem, but there wasn't enough resources to address it. So what Pauline did was she could have, she graduated from Harvard. I mean, she could have gone to a corporation or to a bank and made a lot of money, but she came back to Fields Corner and she created that uh, girls run programs uh, uh, for uh, the Vietnamese girls. Um, another person is Tao Tran, who's not here right now. Um, she grew up in Worcester and um, worked with me in organizing Southeast Asian youth empowerment in the, the public schools in Worcester, made immense institutional change in Worcester, uh, came to Boston, worked for Viet Aid for a short period of time, and she was one of the person who helped organize with uh, other uh, groups um, to bring a lawsuit against the Department of Justice. And the last um, young person that I've been working with, her name is Vi Vu, and um, she was also with the Coalition for Asian Pacific American Youth. Um, again, went to school and now is at Yale. And again, she could do a lot of things, but she focused her thesis and her work on Vietnamese activism, Vietnamese immigrants um, in the Boston area and the contributions that we have made. Um, she's planning to go to law school um, to study immigration law um, to support the Vietnamese community. So those are some of the proud contributions that all of us, uh, especially uh, Anam and HIP has made because they have helped support the leadership of young people. Um, the last major, uh, uh, you know, gift to the Vietnamese community that was a huge collective effort, a lot of people sitting here that are not acknowledged, um, is the center that has been built. And that center has not just been used for the Vietnamese community, but it has been used for other groups as well. Um, for example, yesterday, um, the Dorchester People for Peace um, sponsored a, a, a great talk by um, uh, Camilo Miha, who uh, was talking about um, ending military recruitment in the Latino community, particularly in high schools. Um, and last October, the new majority used the center as uh, a space to gather folks around the, the, the Fields Corner area and in Boston uh, to talk about the candidate uh, forum um, uh, during the right before the election. And it holds uh, people accountable, but it's also a space for different groups to come together and use. And so it's not just a space for the Vietnamese community, although our priority is to serve the uh, Vietnamese community, but links them to the overall revitalization of Fields Corner, which it has done. Um, but not all of those successes come with, 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 um, with uh, some weaknesses and some challenges. There are some areas that we need to work on that, um, you know, that we have to start right away. One is that we need more critical programs that work with young people. We need to recognize um, the fact that they are going through some challenges, but also working with non-traditional, who are not, ac quote, academically successful, um, or, quote, unquote, who are at risk, particularly in the age groups of 12 to 16 and 17 to 21, because that is such a critical age where um, uh, Vietnamese young people need support and the, the, uh, the guidance to um, uh, really move them to a direction that is more comfortable to, for, for them and their achievement. Um, the... The second, the, the last thing that, um, no, I don't know, two more things. The, the, sec, the, the second thing is that um, we really need to focus on the leadership development of uh, young professionals um, in the Vietnamese community between the ages of 25 to 35. And I say that because Annie E. Casey Foundation earlier this year released a report um, calling uh, it, it its name up, um, up next, Generation Change in the Leadership of Nonprofits. In 
this applies to all nonprofits. Um, in the upcoming 10 to 15 years, there's going to be a crisis in the nonprofit community, whereas the baby boomers are retiring, but there's not enough generation of young leaders to take over the nonprofit community and work that is needed. And um, I think the work needs to start there to foster uh, some kind of um, commitment to social change in the nonprofit community. Um, the other challenge, too, is that with, with the space comes uh, working with diverse groups. We have to take – the Vietnamese community also is challenged by – we have to take more initiatives to learn about issues beyond our comfort zone. Uh, for instance, prison issues, gender issues, social change issues, or, um, you know, um, the military recruitment – even if we don't agree with it, we need to open our minds to have a dialogue and uh, to have a conversation about that. Um, and the last challenge that we have is, while I respect, and I know a lot of young people respect the fact that there, that there are um, sort of hostilities and protests against connection uh, uh, with the connection with the Vietnamese uh, communist regime in Vietnam. I don't oppose those protests, but I'm just asking that we use some of that energy towards affordable housing uh, for um, low-income families, um, more affordable child care, which is so needed, and quality education for our young people. And so, you know, some of that synergy and energy needs to be also a applied to those areas in need uh, in addition to uh, working with other groups to make um, this a more just uh, place to live. Before we open up to the audience, um, just I'm going to give the panelists one or two more minutes each to um, they had a couple other questions. They can choose to respond to those or anything else that came to their mind that they needed to say before we, we open up to all of you. So one question was about the recent election. Um, you know, Sam, you and first Asian American in history to be elected to the city council. His story is, hey, I'm not Chinese or Vietnamese. I'm Korean, but nevertheless, he lives in Fields Corner, and certainly he had strong support in the Vietnamese community. Um, but when will there be a Vietnamese American city councilor? Um, that was one of the questions. And the other, um, what should be in the textbooks that Boston Public School children, whether they're Vietnamese or not, are learning about Vietnamese Americans? Um, so those were two questions to be thinking about, but there is many other uh, uh, issues that are critical to the panelists. And so you each have maybe one more round of a couple of minutes each. Okay, thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, let me uh, pick it up again. Uh, I think one of the challenges for the Vietnamese community here is our uh, aversion, our afraid of getting involved in politics. Um, you know, the Vietnamese history, uh, over the past hundred years, we basically, uh, our family tradition discouraged young people to get involved in politics uh, because under the French colonialism, Getting, getting in politics doesn't mean you're going to lose your job, you're going to be sent to prisons. And in the recent history, right now in Vietnam, getting in politics also means that not only you're going to lose your job, but your children, your grandparents, your parents may also lose their jobs. Uh, therefore, we are not very, uh, I would say, we do not look into politics, get into, get into politics is a very, uh, desirable career. Uh, but we also realize that in America, in this democracy, in order, in order to get what we need, we do need to get into politics. And uh, with Sam Yoon's election, uh, election uh, I think that's also uh, give us uh, energy and aspiration that some of us may soon get into uh, politics, so we could do all the things uh, we uh, we need to do. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in uh, Peter's uh, slideshow, uh, we heard of the comments of uh, Councillor Depo uh, O'Neill. Uh, it was not a very kind remark, but I personally uh, was very grateful for his remarks 
because his remark basically galvanized our community. Uh, it basically gave us to our face that you need to do something, you need to get involved. So we got involved. So uh, like it or not, ironically, uh, I'm very uh, grateful uh, for his uh, remark. Uh, Trin also had touched upon the issue of uh, young people getting to uh, leadership role. I think there's real need for that. Uh, but in order for us to have more young leadership, we also have to realize that in our own families, uh, there's a lot of uh, disconnect between the father and the children, between the husband and the wife. I mean, we all know about generation gaps in every culture. But in the Vietnamese community, that gap is even much bigger, huge. The father may be 40 years, 50 years older than the children. He may be 40 years, 50 years older than his wife. He may not speak English, but his wife speak, his children and his wife speak English. And his children may not speak Vietnamese. And the parents also, the father particularly, had suffered through years of tortures, or years of being a soldier, involving uh, experience, a lot of killings. So there's something called uh, post-traumatic disorder syndrome. And we know that U.S. soldiers spend one year in Vietnam have problems. And many Vietnamese men spend not one year, but 10 years, 20 years in that environment. Uh, therefore, once we got here, once we got over the survival phase, it becomes more difficult to live. But actually, living is more difficult than surviving. Uh, and because of uh, our uh, tragic experience, because of the painful losses, uh, the, the experience of young people in the Vietnamese, Vietnamese family uh, may become unbearable. Uh, so to respond directly to one of your questions, Peter, I think uh, in the school committee, it would be very helpful uh, to have some discussion or some classes uh, talking about PTSD, about uh, that experience, that painful experience, how to deal with it, how to relate it to people uh, with that. And it's, uh, I think that experience uh, is not just limited into the Vietnamese community, but Boston School has become more and more diverse, where children coming from Africa also surviving of war and starvation, uh, killing. We have uh, children came from Latin America, also had painful experience. And we also have American kids uh, who the fathers may just return from wars. He or she may not understand what the father is going through. Uh, so I think we, if we have, uh, I may call, cultural diversity, uh, class very tame, very plain, and also uh, if that dealing with the thing that I mentioned, I think it would be uh, very helpful and would be very healthy for our own community. Well, my view with uh, the last election of the city, I would have to say that uh, Many of us here clearly did support Sam Yung, and it is great that he got elected. Would his position or would his um, position change the city? Probably would, in a lot of ways. And uh, would it change the Vietnamese community? Probably not. Um, in this way, civic participation within the Vietnamese community depend who you ask. Um, we have great high die-hard civic participations when it get to certain issues. When it get to civic participation within, you know, the, I don't know, using the term American society or within a city, uh, or maybe it's using the term domestically, 
They probably lack with that. They probably don't know what does that means. For example, they would go out to vote. They would want to go out to vote. Who are they going to vote for? That would be a big question. And uh, clearly, the last uh, the last election, you know, the elected Sam Jim is great for the city. It's about time that we have, you know, diverse candidates, uh, candidates like Sam and whether it would make, you know, big impact with this Vietnamese community? Probably not. Um, that means that we still have a long way to go. And clearly with the, the last uh, story that Peter told us, or a Korean American is not a Vietnamese American candidate. Uh, therefore, uh, Southern California, they begin to have a lot of candidates elected to a lot of uh, lower level positions. And uh, hopefully we will see that in the, in, sometimes in the future. Uh, related to education, clearly uh, there is a need within the city of Boston, uh, you know, to have more diverse curriculum uh, reflected with uh, the population within the city. Uh, how to do that? That would be a long way to go as well. And um, why don't we stop there? As using time for Chun to. Um, I'll just be really brief. Um, Chuck Turner, who is a city councilor in Boston, um, stated three years ago, a, a politician, the best one is the one who's community grown, who understands the community in the context of struggles in diverse communities, but yet know how to navigate throughout the bureaucracies and the administration. That's what sustains the elected official to be effective. And so that's kind of like what I took from Chuck as what does it take to be a good elected official? What does it take for a good Vietnamese American elected official? Well, that plus being Vietnamese American. But I think what Chuck was trying to say was that we need a 10 to 15 year plan if we're, we're going to um, elect a Vietnamese American official because it has to be community grown. We have to know the network and then we have to foster that leadership into electoral politics. Um, I asked both to run and I'll be, I quit my job to be the campaign person and volunteer and go do door knocking, but nobody wants to run. Um, and so I think we're really looking at the younger folks um, to take on a leadership role in fostering more like a 10 to 15 year plan uh, to, to, to get a Vietnamese American uh, elected. And hopefully that person is from Fields Corner in the Dorchester area. Um, in terms of curriculum, uh, just quickly, um, I'm not sure if this is a topic or theme in the curriculum, but um, some sample projects of, of, from the community that bridges uh, parents and children to work together or young people uh, would be really good as a, as a curriculum theme. Uh, Viet Aid three years ago created a project called Our Voices. We were challenged at the fact that we couldn't get the young people to organize with the seasoned Vietnamese elders. And um, what we did was created an oral history project, which, you know, the elders like to tell and narrate stories. And what we did was um, worked with the young people to um, have them navigate, I mean, pull them towards Viet aid and community activism or work uh, through oral history because that's what they're accustomed to. And so that worked for both parties. So some sample um, themes or uh, pro community projects like that would be useful. Anyone in the audience who has a burning question or a comment that you want to make to please come up to the microphone and speak slowly and clearly. feel important. <laughs> of uh, the national politicians, uh, the House and Senate, uh, where would you think you have the strongest support for what your goals are? 
You mean the uh, U.S. Uh, yes. Uh, we, over the past uh, many years, uh, inspired out uh, not very fond of politics. Uh, we have been able to uh, have uh, a number of friends uh, from both uh, Democratic and Republican sides uh, in both the U.S. Senate and on the, on the houses. Uh, for example, in the U.S. Senate, uh, Senator Sam Brownback uh, has been a very strong supporter of uh, our, offer, our effort to bring democracy and human rights to Vietnam. Uh, Senator John Warner from uh, uh, Virginia uh, also very helpful with the issue of uh, uh, local as well as uh, politics helping the former political, political prisoners. Uh, Senator John McCain uh, uh, have been very supportive of uh, uh, family reunification uh, for uh, Vietnamese, particularly uh, those who uh, were uh, working for the U.S. government as well as uh, the former uh, political prisoners. And on the House, uh, uh, the minority leader, uh, Nancy Pelosi, also have been very supportive. Uh, we, have, uh, we have many friends. Just out of curiosity, you didn't mention the Massachusetts senator. Uh, on, uh, that's a very interesting question, uh, uh, Maurice. Uh, on, uh, from the standpoint of uh, refugee assistance, uh, Senator uh, Kennedy has been an extremely, extremely helpful, a wonderful friend in D.C. Uh, from the standpoint of uh, uh, helping uh, Vietnamese in Vietnam, uh, to realize their dream of having some basic human rights uh, and uh, freedom, he's also been very helpful. Uh, however, uh, Senator John Kerry uh, has not been a friend of the uh, Vietnamese community in the U.S. as well as uh, Vietnamese people in, in Vietnam. Can I just comment quickly relate to the process? I mean, obviously, you asked an interesting question. If you go back to the 1970s, uh, Vietnamese here, and we're still looking for our ways. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, we didn't quite know, you know, what the process would be like. And if you go to 1980s, uh, clearly some of us actively, you know, know the political process. You know, if you advocate for certain things, uh, you better go to, I mean, obviously, we, if we can't elect our, ourselves or our people, then then we would well, we, we know uh, who, to, who to go to. Uh, particularly, I think that, you know, on the same issues, when they get to the late 90s, particularly when they get to 2000s, uh, we are actively uh, know the political systems in this country, and, and clearly, you know, those are the issues that, that many of us uh, know the system and actively advocating for, you know, things that we believe in. Good evening. Um, my question has to do with that more local uh, issue from my perspective. I live in Fields Corner. Uh, uh, what do we need to do to get um, the Vietnamese community involved in uh, various parts of Dorchester? I live in Fields Corner, but be it Fields Corner, Meeting House Hill, Savin Hill, um, where, uh, uh, where any person who, who's Vietnamese living, to get them more involved in the day-to-day -day fabric of life in the city of Boston after 30 years as we move forward. Uh, to me, that's going to be the critical juncture. And also going back to what you talked about with, you know, how do you get a Vietnamese American elected? They've got to uh, be as charismatic as Sam Yoon. And they, and, uh, if they, but if they don't have all of those attributes and, and the luck, some of the uh, hard work that he had, but they also have to get out and start meeting other people in a different forum. And for me, that would be getting involved in the day-to-day -day bureaucratic Byzantine life of civic affairs in, in places like Dorchester. So I was just interested in what you folks thought of that. Uh, sure, uh, I, I share your pain. As <laughs> uh, uh, an activist uh, in, uh, in Boston, uh, I, uh, I do uh, wish that uh, more of us get involved with the day-to-day activities of uh, our neighborhood, uh, and I think more of us uh, are getting involved. Uh, the issue has been uh, 
many of us do not know how to get involved. Uh, for example, in the few corners area, uh, many merchants do not know that they could uh, enjoy uh, Dorchester Ball of Trade, for example. Or uh, many uh, families don't even know that if they have problems, they could call the city council uh, to turn on the light if the light is no longer on the street. Uh, so I think there is a need for both outreach uh, from the mainstream organizations, neighborhood, uh, and there's also uh, a need to have a bigger effort from our own community to let people know that getting involved, you will have a better community and uh, a better life in America. It, it clearly, that is the reason why we have the night like tonight. Uh, but it is a, a, a very challenge uh, question, and I'm not sure whether there's an easy solution to, to uh, your question, Tom. And, um, you know, earlier I talked about civic participation. Clearly, depend who you talk to and ask, like, from what perspective do we define, you know, civic participation? If we are talking about, you know, actively talking about issues in Vietnam, many of us, particularly, you know, when it comes to elderly and, you know, my generation is a little bit older uh, generations as well, they, they, they spend a lot of time uh, actively talking about debate meetings and, and picketing or whatever uh, that they might take themselves to. Not that they don't care about where, the, you know, where they lived or the local issues. It's just that, you know, one hand, they may not able to grab uh, the issues. Hey, they, some of them might not have any interest. Some of the, a lot of them have like language barriers. Um, a lot of them tell, you know, told me that, you know, they would go to a local civic, you know, meetings and after they come out, they say, you know, what are they talking about? Uh, you know, that, that type of, 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 um, dynamics that's so hard to bring them back to another meeting. But going to the bottom line, those are the meetings that really, you know, uh, make or break it when it comes to different projects to be built or different businesses to be there or, uh, you know, the lights need to be on, the street need to be cleaned. Uh, not that they don't want to stand, it's just harder for them to grab whatever's out there. We'll take um, one. Oh, do I just you? want to quickly mm -hmm. say that there are chris charismatic quote unquote, and very um, qualified candidates who are Vietnamese, but it's just not his or her fit at the moment. It doesn't mean that we're not active or a few of us are not active. It's just that whether or not we choose to run is, is, it, is what, it's not the direction that we want to take. And also remember, I, I want to state that like Felix Arroyo's campaign, Sam Yoon's campaign wasn't Sam Yoon's campaign. Sam Yoon's campaign was a people's campaign. He won because people mobilized and people from different groups mobilized to get him elected. And that's what it's going to take in this city is not just one ethnic group, uh, but multi-coalition building and working together to change the city of Boston. That's going to make things work and change the politics. We'll take one final question. Good evening. Uh, this question has to do with the role of religion in the Vietnamese community. I know one of the earliest images I had growing up in Boston and thinking about the years of the Vietnam War were the Buddhist monks who self-immolated themselves as a protest. I mean, it was a very powerful thing and had an enormous impact in, uh, in Boston and across the United States. And as part of this organizing element, I know in the black community, the black ministers are very important politically. At least that's what I'm told. And, uh, and I'm curious to know what is the role of religious communities in the Vietnamese community as it affects, to, as it affects community building. And we might not have time for a full answer to this, but a couple of comments, and then we can take it up um, after the program formally ends as well. Uh, in our community, is uh, the reverse effect. I think a part of our problem has been the religious community. Uh, our uh, religious leaders most often would tell their uh, parishers, their Buddhist followers, that don't get into politics. Uh, you just should 
just go to church, go to temple, and do only the religious things. And uh, I think that's one of our problems, one of our challenges. I mean, generally, uh, uh, could be better. Uh, could be uh, actively be part of building communities. Uh, clearly, um, Oh, um, I th- religious institutions and ideologies do influence the the, the shape and, and frame the Vietnamese community, I'm, I'm sure. But I think that's changing with the younger generation. Um, I, that's my assumption, just because that we're um, – young people may be open to – to other institutions and ideologies and not just uh, uh, religion as um, a stronghold like uh, my parents. Before Anne closes the program, I'm going to just finish with a couple of final images. Uh, Another ending to the story. V, I also heard that some students from UMass Boston's Asian American Studies program are doing research about how Hurricane Katrina affected Vietnamese communities in the Gulf region. Maybe we can meet them, and you can do something like that when you go to college. You know, after the hurricane, there was so much attention publicly to the losses, the survivors, all the issues of inequality, and yet very little outside of the ethnic Vietnamese media showed what devastation occurred to the Vietnamese communities that were, you know, very significant in in many of the Gulf Coast um, cities and towns. So New Orleans, Biloxi, um, Mobile, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so where were those uh, voices and stories in the mainstream? They were not there. And so in addition to all the relief efforts um, and the support and fundraising in Vietnamese communities around the country, um, we have some students, uh, a few of them are here tonight from UMass Boston, who actually traveled down to the Gulf Coast in November with their video cameras, cameras, tape recorders to document stories and gather images. And so I'm just letting you know that um, that work is also happening because of the strength of the Vietnamese community in Boston in particular. We have these bilingual, bicultural um, uh, young people who have also the research strengths and interests in the community to do that kind of important work. And um, so you got a handout as you were coming in, hopefully, that tells you a little bit more about that. This is a terrific image uh, from the Lay Bakery, Lay, common uh, last name. Uh, bread will rise again, it needs time. So there are stories of definitely loss, but also stories of resilience. So those are there in the Vietnamese communities in the Gulf Coast. But I can tell you for a fact, there are no organizations in those Gulf Coast communities like Viet Aid, like VACA. There are no leaders at this level uh, in those communities. There actually are some strong religious leaders in those communities, but there's nothing like the civic engagement and clarity of leadership that we have in Boston. And so um, on behalf of all of you, I just thank these three leaders for the work that they do day in, day out. It makes a huge difference, and we are lucky in Boston that they are here. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and I give it back to Anne. That is our program for tonight. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your coming, and if you have any questions and like to take a couple of minutes to talk with our panelists or with Peter, uh, we have the building for but a few minutes. Have a safe trip home. Good night. <laughs>